morning, everyone. 8 a.m. on a Sunday. You made it. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to wake you up quite a bit. Hold on, the mic a little bit. I can't hear you. See, my people are trying to help me. Better? Yes. Yes. So welcome to Difficult Decisions, how to, make, how to bring data into play when legacy services are not thriving. My name is Hillary Thayer. I'm with the Torrance Public Library. And first, I want to say this is not a math or statistics workshop, like hallelujah, woohoo. What we're talking about today is data strategy and applying strategic data to these situations. We often will encounter data applied to something new, like using community needs assessment data to decide where to build a new branch or where to send the bookmobile or where to apply early literacy services. This is data applied to some legacy services that may not be doing well or may not be doing as well as they can in your library. And the way we're going to work today is um, we have four data stories to tell you and we're just going to pass the stories back and forth and then we'll do Q&A at the end. All right? Okay. So I'm going to uh, have our first data story start. Uh, my colleague and I, Heather Furco, who now is with the LA County Library, we're going to talk about the Torrance Public Library's summer reading program. So Heather, introduce yourself. Take it away. Hi, I'm Heather Furco, and um, I'm now with the LA County Library. I'm an acting regional administrator, but I worked for five years for the Torrance Public Library as the youth services supervisor. So I came in to Torrance in 2012. I remember February, and the person who formerly supervised youth services took a lateral transfer to be a branch manager. Um, youth services, the city of Torrance is six libraries and the youth services supervisor supervises um, six children's librarians, one at each location. And so I came in and summer reading was pretty much planned. They had a legacy program that they'd been doing for years. For example, one of my children's librarians used to do the summer reading program when they were a kid. And he was talking about <laughs> retiring when I got there. So um, it was a pre-teen to teen program, six weeks and in person only. And one of the caveats was where you registered, you had to check in and you had to complete the program. So if you registered at the main library, you had to check in and complete at the main library. If you registered at one of the branches, you had to do the same and so on and so forth. And it was very staff intensive. We had a lot of staff members who manned the summer reading desk along with a lot of volunteers. And it was really popular because we would interview each child. Tell me about a book. You know, you would build that relationship. And then um, the other thing that made it sort of unique is since I was over all of the children's librarians, we had a very cohesive program because I was in charge. I picked the performers. I, you know, we worked together and we planned the programs. We had craft boxes. We were doing it all together. But the adult program was sort of under the auspices of six different you know, branch managers, and so they never really had that cohesion. So sometimes they'd have the program, sometimes they wouldn't, you know, it depended on the year. So the f first thing that I did when I got there is I was like, well, what is summer reading about? We had um, all of these wonderful things that sort of built the reading habit. We were talking to the kids about what they were reading. We were, you know, promoting our collections. We were, um, you know, getting them excited about books, but we also had like prizes, a prize every week. So we had to distribute all the prizes, one a week. We had to make sure that everybody got the, their prize every week. We had to, you know, take down all of their data on these little cards, everybody registered, but your card was at the branch that you registered at. And then we also, at the end, which I was like, what is the final prize? It was like a, a thing of coupons. And I'm like, what does that have to do with summer reading? 
I don't know. And so I said to all the librarians, because of course when you come in to an organization, you're supposed to like observe for six months. You don't change everything right away. But I was like, okay, so who's gonna help me get all these coupons together? And there's like silence, crickets, 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 crickets. And I'm like, well, there's no way I'm gonna spend you know, my first six months trying to figure out this job, trying to solicit coupons. So I went back to Hillary and I'm like, um, Hillary, you know, some reading's not really about coupons. Do you think we could ask the friends to give each kid a book who completes? And she's like, write a proposal. I took it to the friends. The friends were super generous. They're like, sure. Summer reading's about books. It builds the reading habit. Why aren't we going to give them books? So we gave them books that first year. So that was a change I made before six months. So I'm. So the next thing we did is, oh, <coughs> sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, I didn't talk about, the, uh, there were a lot of different changes. So that was one we made. Um, we also, so they used to like take, photos of every finisher. Um, first they did Polaroids, then they did digital, but you had to print them all out and cut them all out and post them on the board. And then Hillary, after the 2012 summer reading, Hillary's like, I think we should try to extend summer reading. And I'm like, okay, all righty, we're going to add a week. And there was like great, you know, brr, 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 brr. We take how when are we supposed to take vacation? You know, so we did extend it, and I just said, well, Hillary wants it to be seven weeks. So I just kept that. That was my mantra. <laughs> Hillary wants it to be seven weeks. So we extended it to seven weeks, and then we were looking at who weren't we serving, and we had these super popular story times. I mean, they were packed, jam packed, but we didn't really have a program for pre-readers. So we added this read to me program. So the next thing we did is people were complaining, it's too much work, it's too much work, because at the branches a lot of times, we, they'd have these great big programs and then they'd have like hundreds of people checking in because why? You had to check in at the branch that you were at. So we're like, how do we sort of look at this data and like, what do we need? And so Hillary has said, well, what is the purpose of summer reading? Well, the purpose of summer reading for us was to build the reading habit. So anything that didn't have to do with building the reading habit, we were going to get rid of. So our personal interaction does build the reading habit because you're, you're building that relationship. The reading builds the reading habit, but what does it? A sparkly pencil doesn't really build the reading habit. A cute little rubber ducky doesn't really build the reading habit. And then all of these restrictions. Why can't you go to another branch and check in and or check out because you went to that branch for that program or because that book you wanted was at that program? So we are like, and who else aren't we serving? Why aren't those people able to build the reading habit? We didn't really have anything for you know addressing people remotely, people who couldn't get into the library. So we sort of looked at everything. We looked at all of the data we were collecting. We would have each child fill out a card, then we would take that card and enter it into a spreadsheet. But we didn't do anything with the information we were entering into the spreadsheet afterwards. So why were we doing it? So we made all these changes and you, we got great consternation on the staff. People were coming into my office saying, not as many people are signing up, not as many people are signing up. So we ran the data and we were fine. As many people were signing up. Well, they're not reading as much. We know it, they're not reading as much. They were. Um, they aren't visiting as much. Not as many people are paying visits to the library. Again, we have our door counts. We were fine. Well, they're not checking out as many books. Our circulation's down. Um, no, it's not. And then the branches circulation was up. So we had this perception that was not borne out by data. And I didn't hear this from one person or two people. I was hearing it from a lot of people who were very used to our legacy summer reading. So I started to ask myself, why am I hearing this? Why am I hearing this when the data doesn't say so? And I sort of boiled it down to this. There were shorter lines. If you didn't have to do an elaborate check-in on your library visit, you didn't spend as much time standing in a line. There was less chaos in the branch. After a program, our branch libraries were chaos for an hour and a half because you had to check in 100 kids and give away 100 little rubber duckies and it had to be there and it had to be then. There was less explaining. This program was just easier to explain. An eight-minute explanation turned into a three-minute explanation for those parents 
It just takes less time. It was less work. There weren't weekly prizes. There weren't elaborate rituals. There weren't go through the little card box and find your card. And there were fewer complaints. And we drilled it down to fewer restrictions means fewer complaints. And then the branch managers and Heather and I were not handling these complaints of why doesn't this program work for me. The issue it came down to me is it felt different. We had, over years, a successful summer reading felt stressful. It felt tense. It felt like chaos. It felt like your hair was on fire. <laughs> and we let back to why does it feel so different? So Heather moved on to her massively fun career at LA County, but we built on this. We kept making changes. So we realigned readers and teens while Heather was still there, letting the, that tween age, Heather really built our tween program, letting them choose. Am I going to be a reader? Am I going to be a teen? In 2017, we dropped the grand prizes. They still get a book, but they no longer get this big elaborate. We had drawing jars. We had scratch coupons. And we just went, again, does it build the reading habit? No. Then in 2018, I charged the Summer Reading Committee and the Youth Services Supervisor with another thing. I said, I want one program. Right now, we have four programs that share some branding. I want one program, and I want one service point once. Like the whole family comes in, the whole family signs up. So they went back, and they re-articulated purpose. And this is so important when you're drilling down into data with your legacy services to re-articulate, like write it on paper, what is your purpose? Without me saying make it longer, seven weeks is now 10, 10 weeks long. They made it all ages, with all ages being able to self-select what program they want to be in. And we added online participation for the first time. You can completely participate online to reach those readers who weren't coming into the library. Now let me tell you this is scary because a lot of our librarians when we talk about adding online participation said, but the personal interaction, which is so important, which does build the reading habit. And I said, that is still valuable. That happens in the library. How do we make the online participation feel that way? And these people who can't come in the library, they're getting nothing right now. So we're going to give them something. So we rearticulated our purpose. And it expanded a bit because we were expanding ages. So we are now fostering a community of lifelong readers and learners by building the reading habit, honoring the reading process, bridging reading to learning, offering learning in diverse forms, and connecting the reading community. And this is our articulated purpose. Any decision about summer reading, we go back to the purpose. Does it meet one of these goals? We also set goals for our first year so that we could evaluate this new 10-week program, this online participation. Did we meet our goals? So articulated goals drove the development of summer reading. So 10 weeks long, online participation, all ages self-selection, very limited prize options. Again, you see a theme here, we keep cutting prizes because prizes <coughs> didn't serve purpose. So we, we, there is a prize, there is a tangible something, but we limited it again. Standardized programming expectations across all our branches and our main library. So this was not, oh, the kids department does this summer thing and I just have to work the desk for two hours a day. And all staff were trained as ambassadors, and all staff worked the summer reading desk. I worked the summer reading desk. Library pages worked the summer reading desk. Everyone. So what we encountered is we went from a haphazard adult program to adults fully included, one program. We also were encountering we our special needs populations. We always wanted them to participate, but we had to build an exception for them if they needed it. With self-selection, they are built in automatically because everybody selects the reading goal that suits them. So an adult with a learning or developmental disability can participate in the same program as an eight-year-old who's learning to read. A teen who's one of those super advanced readers can participate in the adult program. We let everyone self-select, which means our special needs populations became seamlessly part of the program. We went from SRP being a youth program to a library program. We added online participation and take a look at that last bit of data. Our previous record for registration in our entire 20 year history that I had data back was 5,875. We, we registered 9,258 people last summer and we hit our, uh, we broke our completion record as well 
3,505 people completed, and our previous record was 2,791. So again, data has borne out that this is successful in meeting the reading needs of the community. And that's the story of Summer Reading Program at Torrance Public Library. So now we are going to move on to our next speaker, Mina. Introduce yourself and take it away. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mina Abdullayan. I'm from the I'm the adult <coughs> programming librarian from the Fresno <laughs> County Public Library. And my story is very similar to LA's story. And I don't want to repeat what uh, Heather and Hillary were describing, but I, I just want to add uh, a portion that uh, we did, and we did use data to decide uh, to continue having a program or just cutting it up. And uh, sometimes service uh, improvements means replacing programs that are not attracting audience. So um, in 2013, we decided to add summer reading program, uh, including adults in that service. And uh, we, a lot of people participated, and it was a new thing. We advertised it, we marketed it well, and a lot of people showed up. But, well, we continued doing it. The programs were well received, well attended, except the reading portion of it. We decided to change the incentives, better incentives, better prizes for the next year. Mm -mm. As you can see, <clears throat> the next year for the better incentives worked a little. But then we continue doing it, and it shows that no. Although adults are participating and attending our programs, but not reading portion of the summer reading program. We put all the data together and realize that we need to make decision. Sometimes it's hard to cut a service, but uh, the data was uh, there to show that, uh-uh, it's not working. And at that time, uh, we had a priority. We need to do, prioritize our services. At that time was teens. We decided to focus more on the teen portion of the summer reading program. So, uh, on two, t uh, yeah, on 2016, was, which was the last year that we did portion, I mean, that section of reading only for adult reading program, uh, we stopped doing it on 2017 and put all our chips for the teens. As you can see, the numbers are coming down and down. So we decided it was a hard decision but we had to take it, and we took, we stopped. Uh, we continue our pro adult programming during the summer, well received and well attended. And uh, this year, after the Hardwood um, Institute and assessment of the community and serving the community, we noticed that it is required. And all, we all know that communities change. And the change has come to Fresno. And it is needed to bring back the adult uh, reading portion of the summer reading challenges. So that is my speech. And uh, thank you for listening. All right. So now we're going to move from the legacies of summer reading program, which are reaching deep to Edwin, and we're going to start talking about another legacy, the service desk. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Edwin Rodarte. I am a librarian at the Los Angeles Public Library. So for those of you who know, uh, our system is composed of uh, 72 libraries 
and we have about um, we also have a central library which has about nine different subject departments so in a sense um, each department operates like its own branch so we have about 80 or so uh, potential like service desk or service locations so uh, my legacy service is more about capturing data and the serv and how we were capturing data at those service points so I'll be talking a little bit about how we decided to move from a paper-based um, uh, tallying form to an online-based form during our service uh, uh, week that we do. Uh, so essentially, we collect uh, data statistics on our service once a week, uh, one week out of every month. So uh, basically, we're collecting this at 12 uh, weeks throughout the year to give us an idea of how we're, per to, we're performing. So, uh, just out of curiosity, I guess I was going to ask, how many of you here are still collecting data at your service desks via tallies? Awesome. That was us, too. <laughs> so, uh, so I think the idea was to, how can we improve the service model, and how can we make it easier for staff to not have to submit the data? So essentially, the process of collecting the data, aggregating the data, submitting the data, then reporting the data out. So what was it that we could improve in, um, in having them do less of that uh, and then get more out of it? So I'll be just um, talking about what we did and how we did it. So obviously we went through an evaluation process um, trying to figure out the intake form itself. Um, I'm gonna go back to the other slide so that you can see some of the data points that we were collecting. Um, Sorry. I think previous. I'll get there. <laughs> there you go, okay, awesome. And so we were collecting things like, you know, obviously our, how many reference transactions, how many circulation transactions, but we were also capturing things like how many of those questions are basically just directional questions. Uh, how many uh, were related to our initiatives, which were health related, um, citizenship related, um, homelessness related, um, let's see. And then I think for the most part that was said, I might, uh, financial literacy was another one. So you know, we're collecting all of this data, we're asking a lot of librarians to kind of categorize a lot of the things, uh, and we were uh, needing to evaluate or reevaluate to see if those were the categories that we were wanting to move forward with. And uh, one thing that you need to uh, take in mind is that you know, you're collecting all of this data, but how has it been utilized in the past? Are you just collecting data for the sake of collecting data? Or are you actually evaluating uh, the, the need and the, the use of it? So we have all, all of this historical data years past that we could utilize uh, to make a report on. And so uh, essentially we needed to make sure that those categories were needed or not. So we actually did the opposite. Our pilot form was, let's add more, serv more information <laughs> because it's gonna be digital, so it'll be easier to collect. Uh, so we added things like, you know, uh, we wanna know how many of those transactions are telephone-based transactions. We wanna know uh, how many are actually, uh, what's the length of, a, of an interaction that you're spending with. Uh, and then things like, um, let's see. Uh, roving was another one. How many of these transactions are happening in a roving, you know, you're not at an actual service point, but you're roving throughout the library and somebody just stops you to ask you a question. So after doing, um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Uh, you can see our progress of the forms uh, starting from, and we wanted to do all this in-house so we didn't actually purchase a, like a, a live statistics or any analytics uh, toolkits. So the first was a Google form that was super long. <laughs> so you can already tell, like, you know, obviously you can't be in the desk and try to <laughs> fill out this Google form um, for every transaction, especially if you're at a busy branch or a busy service point. So then we tried to shrink it down to, um, to l less questions um, at a time. So it went from, like, being this regular form to then evaluating the actual questions and see if we actually needed all of those questions. So we went back and the final form that we're currently using now, it's that very last one, which only asks the service point, is, was it a reference or circulation or a roving transaction? It only asks uh, if they have time to input um, the, if this was um, Neo Americans, which is the, the only service um, that we were interested in still collecting data for because we're evaluating our process for that. Um, and then if it was something like a telephone transaction, 
a bilingual interaction or um, if it was more than five uh, like questions because we wanted to know if there was like a lengthy conversation as opposed to just a one one off question. So those were the only survey points that we d decided to collect so that staff could just go to the branch uh, and then click a button if they needed to to submit it and then click it again click it again if they didn't have the time to actually uh, submit the other the other information. So what this did is that it gave us a little bit more information that we had before. We had real life data. Uh, essentially, we had all of the entry points of the transactions so that we can actually uh, graph the interactions throughout the day. So that wasn't something that we had before in terms of tallying. You know, we didn't have like how is your day going? What's the busiest time throughout the day? Uh, and that you could utilize that data to potentially put in more service or more staff at those locations. So that was one of the things for a benefit from digital forms. So just if you're curious as to what we were doing, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> we decided to use a Google form, but we customized it. So we just cleared out all the code uh, and we just uh, coded our own form and then um, tie that form to an actual Google form on the back end uh, so that uh, uh, staff were actually sending stuff through a Google form, but they didn't know it's a Google form. It's just a, a, a form that they were seeing. So what this did is that utilizing Google's own product, which is um, uh, Data Studio, Google Data Studio, we created um, um, the visual representation of what was happening at their branches. So this is the, the data dashboard that we created for them. Each staff member or any uh, of the staff are able to log in on the back end and view what's going on at the branch, real live data. So as soon as they submit a, 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 a transaction, this graph changes automatically. As soon as they're actually uh, um, submitting uh, any, any point of data, then this is gonna be updating on real life data. So we do this on a monthly basis. It's being constructed and then it gives them a little bit of idea. And it also gives them a little bit of like healthy competition. If we go to the other uh, slide, we pair them by uh, areas. So essentially uh, each area can see everybody else's uh, data points so that they know how they're performing against their peers uh, so, and get an idea of what it is that, that they're doing at their branches. So. The blue is actually our circulation traffic um, uh, versus the red, which is our reference traffic. So you can already tell that two thirds, uh, for the most part overall in our whole system, two thirds of all interactions happen at the circulation desk. So our, your most valuable point of service is the circulation desk, because that's the first point of contact. Um, then you can also see that there's certain branches that have more re uh, roving transactions, there's references that have a higher uh, percentage of bilingual interactions where you may need to actually have bilingual staff in place to handle those questions. So it gave us a lot of information that we could potentially utilize to um, augment services at the library. And some of the other one, uh, the next one. So this is kind of like a, a peak periods uh, chart that's also part of their dashboard. So they can uh, see, go in here and see what times throughout their uh, day or their week, uh, they, they're having the highest um, traffic at the library so, uh, that they, so that they can get an idea of how to utilize this um, uh, to also do like potential staffing for that day as following or for those spe specific time frames. And uh, let's see, lessons learned. <laughs> so uh, I guess I already mentioned lessons learned, you know, we, we noticed that two, two of thirds of all transactions happen at the circulation desk. Uh, Three percent of our bilingual interactions are, are all, of all interactions are bilingual for our system. So there's a need for that bilingual um, uh, staffing. Uh, Seven percent percent of all transactions happen over telephone. Uh, so you know, making sure that you know sometimes telephone calls take a little bit longer or they're harder. So it's not just having service like one on one uh, in person, but also like what are you doing to to have those um, interactions. Um, and then the next steps, uh, it's the evaluation process. It's always um, a process. So I think uh, evaluating what's working on the current system and how we can improve it to move it forward. Uh, so what categories, are we evaluating the categories and see if that's the same thing that we want to do. We've been collecting the New Americans data, but do we still want to do it? Do we want to switch it for something else? 
um, do we want to start collecting language data so that it's specific to the language? Uh, right now, we're just having a bilingual category, but maybe we're, we're interested in knowing the specific language that is being uh, requested for each of those uh, interaction points. Um, and then having a timeline as to what that would look like. Um, what did we do with all the historical reports? How are we utilizing that data? Um, and um, you know, just uh, involving staff throughout the whole process. Um, that that first uh, the the pilots of uh, of the first implementation of the the forms took us about six months for for uh, from the initial process to the end product uh, because we went through a lot of uh, iterations of of what that uh, form was going to look like for branches. And now branches don't have, or branch librarians or the supervisors, as soon as they report everything, I have, uh, or our department has all of the data in the back end. So they don't have to fill out a report. They don't have to basically tally everything themselves. They don't have to submit uh, any of the data because everything's automated for them. I can just uh, download the spreadsheets, aggregate the data myself, and then just automatically update it to our database. All right, so staying on the theme, we'll do a Q&A at the end. Um, staying on the theme of service desks, let's talk to Sean about another way of using data to review the use of the service desks. Hi, I'm Sean Townsend, and I don't have much of a voice today because I've talked so much for the last couple of days, so I'm going to be really close to this microphone. Um, I work for um, LSNS Libraries as a collection development manager, but a while ago, I worked for the Long Beach Public Library. And one of the things that we did there was take on our main library's desk situation. As everyone has maybe been at a main library and you have multiple service desk points, public service desk points, and scheduling those service desk points can be a nightmare. So um, it all started in 2011 and it was at an info people workshop. So if you're an info people workshop kind of person, if you like going to, um, uh, just all of their stuff, whether it's webinars or anything, I just love info people and they're amazing, especially for new libraries, librarians. But one of the workshops that we went to um, for staff members from the main library was the leading from any position. And it was very valuable because I was just a general librarian and in a position where I didn't really feel like I had a lot of power and I was feeling very, mm, I don't know, tired. And you know, just sort of always having to do the same thing and not really feeling like I have a voice. So you go to some of these workshops to see, maybe in the future when I'm in management, maybe I can make some good decisions. This workshop empowered you to, at your level, think about what you could do to, um, if there's low hanging fruit in your own job that you can you know, go ahead and discard. If there's a conversation you can have with your boss, maybe go ahead and try to have that conversation. But uh, the other thing that it did is it brought people together to discuss problem solving certain bigger issues. And so we had very large issues all over the walls and everything, and you picked and you chose what you want to potentially take back to your library and solve over, in some form or fashion, over a six month period of time. And then you came back at that six month point and talked about where you were with that. So the four of us went back to Main Library and we discussed with our managers the age-old problem of we have eight service points at this library. We have um, had the central reference, telephone reference, electronic information center, periodicals, teen, youth services, government publications, and fiction media. And if you've ever been in a library situation where you have that many desks, you know that you don't need them all. You like intrinsically know this and anecdotally know this, but you don't have any data to really prove that. So what we knew was that the staff was tired and angry that they weren't getting their work done. And staff who, basically everyone at Maine had system-wide duties. So we also couldn't get all of our work done because we started working you know, two hours on desk every day and then it was three and then it was four and sometimes it was five hours a day on desk. And you can't do massive collection development projects for your system when you're at the main reference desk. And um, 
impacted by questions all the time. One time my boss actually deleted an entire like $15,000 list in Baker and Taylor because he thought he had already like hit send or something like that and, and didn't. So then he had to start all over. So you have those moments where you're feeling very personally frustrated and impacted by your time on the desk every day. And it's emotionally exhausting when you have populations that are hard to deal with and you're on that desk all day and you're just, you're just tired. So everyone at the main library felt very impacted by being on desk all day. So how can we solve this? So we can do what we always did, which was um, complain. Complain to each other, <laughs> complain to management. <laughs> and it got to the point where the, there was only one person, one um, DL, department librarian, who was tasked with doing all the scheduling. And no one liked the way she scheduled. So management solution was, okay, you have three DLs here. You guys take turns doing this. And then they, were, they learned over time, it's really, really hard. It's constantly jockeying every single day and sometimes every hour of every single day and changing that schedule. And that it's not that this person wasn't good at it. It's that it's so hard and convoluted, nobody will be good at it. And they talked about maybe using software or whatever, but at the end of the day, the real problem was that there were eight service points and only so many people at Maine. So morale was low, um, but management can't act on anecdotal evidence. They weren't, they didn't. Um, that's not gonna empower them or in incentivize them in any way to get, you know, jump in and help you make some sort of decisions when all you're doing is complaining to them. So we thought maybe we could solve this by doing a massive study of what's done at each desk. And um, not to go in with preconceptions, not to go in solving this before and saying I know what the solution is gonna be, but letting the data really reveal itself to us. And, um, and it surprised us in some cases. So what um, you were talking about, um, collecting the right data is very important. I personally think at the end of it that we collected too much data. And as you can see from this form, I would do anything to go back in time and have what you're doing at LA here, you know, to do this project. Because we had a form on a legal piece of paper it was humongous and time intensive for each individual to fill out and it was really, it was a labor intensive project. So we love the staff for doing it, but we lay the law on them. So the real aim of the study was to identify um, information needs at the service points and then the resources that were used. So we focused on those two things. And then we also wanted to see from that data what inefficiency that we could find at the end of uh, the data, the service points. Um, any missed opportunities at those service points. And then at the end of that, to brainstorm some ideas to fix this particular problem. And in that brainstorming, see what else the staff was thinking about. Because at that point, they were feeling very listened to and empowered. So this collection log, oh, I'm sorry, it's on the back, back. one. Um, this collection log was created, and we threw every all the spaghetti on the wall and put it in the collection log. And then people would very diligently fill it out, what resources were used, how much time they spent. And I don't know if you've ever been to the main library back five years ago or more um, when they did this, but they had, like your service points weren't just a whole bunch of service points, but they were wildly far apart. And then one was like a glass enclosure, and we called it once um, Anchorman came out, the glass case of emotion, um, because you were just in there with people like walking by, and but it wasn't covered on the top, so you could hear everything, and it was just crazy. So just working on getting the data for all of these extremely different service points was very fascinating. Um, the afterward, the brainstorming that occurred. We took all of this data and we shared it with the staff and we shared it in a few different meetings with them and had brainstorming sessions with those meetings to say, look at this data, did you know this about the service desk? A lot of the time it was kind of obvious, like government pubs really didn't have a lot of action and no one was ever asking for government publications. They were always, because there was a little computer center next to it, so you were manning that computer center. So why was a librarian manning a computer center? You know, and how are we serving our time? So some things bore out with what they were thinking anecdotally, 
but some things were very surprising to them. So then they got to go do some brainstorming. How would you fix this service point? How would you fix all of the service points? What massive changes would you make to this library? And it really got them thinking about things. And we listened to people who were very vocal, and we also listened to people who wanted to think about it a little bit, gave them the space to put little post-it notes or something like that up later on after they'd thought about it. So you always want to make sure if you're accommodating your staff that you're accommodating the extroverts as well as the introverts, because the introverts are brilliant too. And, next slide. So for our report to admin, we compiled everything, we gave them the raw data, we gave them everything that we got out of the survey and presented it to them and said, you know, now you can use this data to make your decision, whatever your decision is on the service desk. And that gave them the power at that point to feel comfortable if they were going to make a hard decision about changing service desks or eliminating service desks that they could go to their city manager and be accountable for that decision with more than just my staff is really unhappy and complaining and I felt like this was the right thing to do. So. Let's go to this. So when they um, made the decisions, they also had staff buy-in at that point. You're always going to have one or two people that you'll never get buy-in from. So you just sort of have to like let the machine go on. But for the most part, you had staff buy-in with everyone else. Um, and they could defend the decision to anyone that they needed to. So what were the outcomes? So at the end of this project, what did library management do? Um, the study allowed them to see, and this was a really important thing because remember they had a telephone reference box in the middle of the library. So this allowed them to see how information seeking behaviors had changed over the years. And then also to think about how they might change in the next few years. And so not just exist in the space and time of 1978 or 1985 or 1995, but exist in today's world and think about tomorrow. So they did eliminate some of the desks entirely. They also combined some desks. So before we were very librarians sit here, clerks sit here, circulation is over there. And then it became more about consolidating those desks, those service points so librarians and clerks could sit together. Instead of saying, oh, I'm at the reference desk, you're gonna have to go back there to this other desk where the clerks can help you. Because that's a customer service nightmare. So they also freed up um, more public spaces for people by eliminating those desks and creating little nooks and crannies. But then what happened after that I think is the most exciting thing because I think every, I left like right when this was presented I went to Upland. And um, Carrie Lixie was also a part of it and almost immediately after that she went to your Belinda. So Susan Jones was basically the only one still you know there doing all of this and so she is a very creative person and she had so much buy-in with the management staff and the invigoration from other staff that they were able to eliminate all of the periodicals holdings that we had, historical holdings that were taking up just an enormous space for no reason and manage that space differently. We had um, some oddly conceived of things put in nooks and crannies that we were able to switch so they could create the studio, which is their big, wonderful maker space that's renowned. And then they just started rethinking everything else about what they could do. And I'm not sure if you remember this, but in 2017, LBPL was the winner of the National Medal of Museum and, Informa and, and Library Services. And um, I feel strongly, because I have an ego, that we were totally a part of making that happen, <laughs> at least the kernels of it. So that's really, you know, when you take something and you just explode it out for years, you can have massive change with it. Thank you. All right. So I just want to highlight a couple of themes and then we'll do questions. Um, one of the themes in ours is that just because it is a legacy service that people may love, they love their summer reading, they love their reference librarian, doesn't mean not to explore it with data. And, and also the highlighting, as Sean said, um, presenting data to management to make decisions, to make effective decisions and be able to stand behind their decisions for change. And then also how Collect the, collecting the right data, as Sean highlighted, probably way too much in the beginning more than you needed, and in summer reading, what we were doing doesn't always mean more data. Sometimes it means dumping data that's useless to you that costs you to collect, and then really being strategic and using your data, articulating your purpose. So now it's time for questions, and I know you had a question. Uh, yeah, my, my question was, and maybe we're an outlier, um, to Evan. Um, Question. So, the service desk actually is logging questions that they receive during transactions. 
I'm just going to repeat the questions for the filming. So the question was, is the circulation desk actually logging questions they receive, and it's for Edwin? Yes, that's correct. So uh, it's a, more of an interaction at that point. So what is the, but they do get a lot of questions. So the, yes, so anytime they get asked a question, whether that is, you know, um, like uh, I need to renew a book uh, or things like that, then they can log, they log those questions as well. So. And there's not staff <coughs> Um, I think it's the legacy service was already doing that regardless. So uh, I just just transferring the the that same to an online or a digital form. Uh, so. I'll chime in on Edwin because at Torrance we also moved to a Google form to collect our desk statistics for analysis, and we did have resistance to circulation having to log questions, and my kind of speaking back point to them as a director was what you do is valuable. I need the data to show how valuable it is to speak for you. And then they were able to grab that data to report back to me changes they needed, stuff they were spending along. So I, I tried to spin of you are valuable, but we need the data. So yes, other questions? For anyone? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, we had some heated, I had some heated meetings with my e-services librarians that are like, uh, people expect a different prize every week. <laughs> they expect it. They're going to complain. And I was like, but do you know how much time it takes for us to send out a different prize every week? Because, of course, the staff at the main library were the ones who were in charge of distributing everything. So that was like that much more work on the staff at the library that I was at. And we also statistically usually had more programming than the branches did because we were open longer. So I was just like, but let's try it. Let's just see. And then what I did is I said, here's my card. Anyone who complains, hand them my card. <laughs> Guess what? Not one single phone call. Not a one. I think you're right about a lot of it is internal. It's perception. Like it's built into us. Here's what this meaningful thing to me is, and here's why it's valuable and important. Um, and another example from summer reading, when we eliminated taking kids' pictures, which was costing time, it was film, it was paper, it was trouble. It was like a huge staff burden. I was told they're going to complain. They're going to complain. And what I asked the branches to do is I said, save every photo that is not picked up from last year. I want you to save them. And we got maybe two people who said, oh, you don't do the photo? And what we pulled out was the giant packet of photos that the parents had never picked up. And, and we, and in one interaction I had, I said, yes, you know, it's film, it's cost. And I'm talking about cost from a very efficiency point of view. And they're not getting picked up. They're not really getting used. And she went, oh. Yeah, mine's probably in there somewhere. I never picked it up last year. <laughs> so um, again, like the actual tangibles become the story. And then as Heather said, the we're going to try it. And having an articulated purpose that you're going to go back to, did we meet our purpose? And you know what? If, the, if that had made a difference, there's nothing that says you can't put it back in next year. Everything was a pilot. Everything, yeah. 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 The, the word pilot project. <laughs> pilot, pilot, pilot. We're just going to try it for six months. I did a lot of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I, I apologize. I, I think from the beginning you talked about that the, you talked about it, then I apologize. But could you also apply this method, the CC, to some the programs? Programs that now become legacy. Yeah. And sometimes it has been where I noticed that it really is more about the staff that really love to plan it mm -hmm. than me coming in. Um, do you have any experience with that? The question was about can you apply this type of thinking to programs? Yes, and yeah, I think yeah, yeah, definitely, mm -hmm. and it is very valuable, um, especially the. Um, are you talking about the method that Edwin was describing? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. All I can say, yes. <laughs> I think I think that it, to apply it to program, 
and whether it's a standalone or a series or a book group or a film series is one of the recommendations I would make is go back and articulate per your purpose again because mm -hmm. we have mission creep all over the place and we will lose our purpose in the stuff. Go back to the why and then build out from that again. So is the why to get new people into the library? What data do you need to show you're doing that? Is the why to simply provide an enjoyable environment for your population? Well, you're gonna need to collect data in some way, whether it's a proxy data or a survey. Articulate your purpose again, because sometimes people have drifted from purpose and then they end up working at cross purposes. Mm -hmm. And um, you can always do that, just go back and drill down, articulate your purpose again. And sometimes people go, I don't know, they just have fun. Well, having fun is not a bad thing, but if you're investing resources from an administrative perspective, which is always my perspective, we're investing, but go back and articulate the purpose. If I had to defend your two hours, four hours planning, what am I gonna say that we're doing? And so that's, that's always a good place to start. That's a huge part of it is the two hours or four hours because a lot of the time people are like, but it's just an hour program once a week. But how much time on the back end are you spending prepping for this program, cleaning up for it? What's the impact of this program on the rest of the staff? One of the libraries that I'm familiar with had um, a, a years long habit of having massive programs or not even that massive programs like every single program impacted the entire library because the children's staff would all have to be in this program and then other desk staff would have to come upstairs and sit at that desk what the heck you know so it's like it's just a program you only need you and a volunteer doing this why do you need three other children's staff in here doing this for you and so you really have to rethink like what you're doing and why you're doing it and drill down into the, the heart of it and figure out what's going on. And sometimes you will make compromises in drilling back down to purpose. One of the things we did in the recession at Torrance is we had to keep all our open hours and cut staff. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking for like every five minutes that we could cut out of something was gonna be, they could be doing something else. And we stopped registration for story times. Again, we were talking about cards for summer reading cards and limits because I realized that what it meant was a story time meant a librarian doing story time and it meant a manager telling people why they couldn't come in. Yeah. And just by stopping registration and coping with the crowds, which maybe meant more little scarves to weigh around and it meant more stickers, I halved the staff of story time, like with that one thing. And then we helped people cope with that decision. But w I needed that manager not standing at the door explaining to people why they couldn't come into story time. I needed them on a desk. So sometimes a single decision at a critical point is gonna twist your program and you just gotta work with that as well. So I know that we have actually used up our time and people are probably waiting to get in the room, but I wanted to say thank you to our presenters and invite you to come up and ask some questions. Thank you. Thank you.